Before we move on to the slaughterhouse cases, I want to deal with something that arises during in the intervening years. So from 1833 to 1873, a few things happen. Um, for most important for the rest of this class is that the Civil War Amendments are passed. Now, the Civil War Amendments, more specifically the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, uh, do a number of things. First off, formally, they overturn the Dred Scott decision, um, which we'll revisit in the racial discrimination section. Um, they were largely designed to settle issues which had led to the South seceding from the country um, and, and deal with issues that, that arose and also caused that. So first off, the 13th Amendment um, passed in 1865 abolishes slavery. Um, second, the 14th Amendment uh, ratified in 1868 does two things. One, it provides that everyone born in the United States is a citizen of the U.S. and the citizen of their state. And also, two and the one that will be important for the rest of this class is that equal protection and due process cannot be denied by any state of the union. The 15th amendment uh, ratified in 1870 um, gives African-Americans the right to vote, gives African-American males uh, the right to vote. Um, but this 14th amendment is, is seriously a workhorse um, and it will be sort of the underpinning of everything we do going forward. Now, I said that the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868. Therefore, it predates the slaughter case, slaughterhouse cases. So the slaughterhouse cases absolutely should be affected by the passage of this 14th Amendment. So let's deal with what the 14th Amendment specifically says. Uh, it says the passage that we're concerned with, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges and immunities of the citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of laws. Now, this probably sounds similar to the Fifth Amendment, and it should, because a lot of the language is similar, but this is very clearly different, because while the Fifth Amendment limits federal government, the 14th Amendment is very clearly in existence to limit state governments and to make sure that state governments have to comply with due process and have to comply with equal protection. Well, this would seem, at least in part, to invalidate the previous case of Baron v. Baltimore. Now, why would that be the case? Well, it requires that individuals be under equal protection. And what does equal protection mean? It simply means that based upon an individual's jurisdiction, they are not under different rule of law. So individuals who live in New Mexico um, should not be under different applicable laws as opposed to individuals that live within Texas. So it doesn't mean that New Mexico can't have its own individualized laws and Texas can't have its own individualized and particularized laws. That's not what this means. What it means is that the mechanisms of justice, the way by which things are united, should be similar across the two states. Um, therefore, if another state has something similar to a takings clause, um, then other states would applicably have to have uh, a takings clause because that would mean that equal protection uh, and due process is different depending upon what state you reside in. Um, so it would seem that Baron v. Baltimore is, in, at least in part, overturned by the 14th Amendment's protection. Well, that's simply not the case, in, at least as the Supreme Court is concerned. So let me give you the facts of the Slaughterhouse case. So Louisiana passed a law um, which restricted slaughterhouse operations within the city of New Orleans to a single corporation. Um, so before this law, um, butchers and slaughterhouses could operate within the city of Orle New Orleans absolutely independently. But after this law is passed, um, one specific company received a charter to run all of the slaughterhouses um, within the city with, because of the maintenance of it being downstream. No other areas within the city were permitted to having a slaughterhouse for animals um, and all other existing slaughterhouses were to be closed. So a group of butchers, of individuals who would be employed by slaughterhouses, um, argued that they were, they were that this law was going to deny them the right to practice and the, deny them the right uh, to have a livelihood. 
Um, so they made a number of arguments. Uh, first, they argued that it was a violation of the 13th Amendment. Knowing that the 13th Amendment prohibits slavery, the argument they were making is that this law would, in essence, if they wanted to carry out their livelihood, require them to work for this one company who had exclusive license. The slavery argument might be a whole lot of stretched in this case. But they also make a further argument under the 14th Amendment, and they argue that they're being denied life and liberty uh, without due process of law simply by the passage of this law. So the 14th Amendment should prohibit this action um, from Louisiana. So the issue in this case is, does this creation, um, does this monopolistic action um, by the state uh, violate the 14th Amendment? And it seems that it should. Um, it's not as though the, the um, justices of the Supreme Court are going to have to weigh out and think about what the drafters of this amendment made. It was literally done five years previous. Um, the record could be is very clear about what the drafters of the 14th Amendment had anticipated. And they had absolutely anticipated that the 14th Amendment would prohibit uh, states from engaging in certain sort of activities. Well, the vote in this case could not be more decided. And, and let me tell you that with... <laughs> Five, four decisions of the Supreme Court, despite all of the press that they get and all the importance that they seemingly have, they are fairly rare. And they're even more rare looking through the 1800s and early 1900s, primarily because um, the court was not too divided on a large number of these issues. But in this case, um, in a in a five four decision, um, the court could not be more divided, uh, and so uh, Justice uh, Samuel Miller writes the majority opinion um, of a sharply divided court, and says that there's no possibility uh, in this case that this monopoly uh, runs afoul of the Fourteenth Amendment, because his argument the Fourteenth Amendment only is intended. Um, to focus on African Americans and the denial of their equal rights and their due process, but it never was intended to apply to all citizens. And because of that, these butchers who were made up of uh, primarily uh, Caucasian individuals, the 14th Amendment is not a protection of them. Um, the court argues that they're absolutely not deprived of liberty without due process because they absolutely can still practice butchering, they just have to work for this company. So they're, they're not deprived it. They simply have to do it under certain guarantees. So the court in a sharply divided decision holds up the law from Louisiana as constitutional and therefore and not violating the 13th and 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Well, this case in 1873 largely guts the meaning of the 14th Amendment. Um, in so much as it, it defines the 14th Amendment and much more broadly the Civil Rights Amendments as a whole as only applying um, to African Americans and more, spe nor, more specifically freed slaves. And because of this decision, um, the ability of the federal government to legislate in this particular area and also uh, for states to be able to for states to be under uh, the restrictions of the 14th Amendment were, were eroded. That the court said that this 14th Amendment only applies in very particularized cases dealing with African Americans and freed slaves and doesn't apply elsewhere. And so the process of incorporation is halted and delayed. Uh, and we'll see that in upcoming cases that that process gets restarted and begins to move away from this ideological divisiveness of the 1870s to a more sort of consensus operation um, by the time we get into the 1950s and 60s. 
questions? All right, we are going to come back and revisit uh, the slaughterhouse cases in um, our racial discrimination section. But right here, I'm just dealing with it um, as an incorporation case. Uh, so I, I'm not dealing with all of the other issues that are going on, of which there are a plenty in the slaughterhouse cases. Um, but I'm particularly just looking at the applicability of the 14th Amendment um, to the states, in which, in this case, the court rules that the 14th Amendment applies to the states, but only in exceedingly limited circumstances.